So months ago, this soldier took part in the old army game of filling out a form. This time, however, he didn't mind so much because it was a questionnaire designed to give the authorities some help in providing for his mental and physical welfare. On the last page, he found a space in which he was asked to write any information he wished to bring to the attention of his officers or to ask any questions that had not been answered for him through more ordinary channels. He asked a question. And thousands of other men stationed in Burma and India asked the same question, which in this picture is answered personally by the commanding general of IBT, General Dan I. Sultan. I'm quite aware that when you came to the movies this evening, it was not because you wanted to look at me on the screen. This is, nevertheless, the only way that I can talk to all of you. So if you can grit your teeth and stand it for a few minutes, I should appreciate it. More than half the Americans, in the answer to the questionnaire, stated that they did not understand why American troops should be stationed in India and Burma. They did not know why they were here, and they said so, emphatically. Some of them used words that, uh, well, let's say they were emphatic and let it go at that. Now, this lack of knowledge on the part of the troops is not surprising in a theater as vast as this. The very geography of the area sometimes makes it almost impossible for us to see the end result of what we have been doing. What's more, the recent recall of General Stilwell and the splitting of CBI into two separate theaters may well have added to the confusion in the GI's point of view. And yet the answer is as simple as beans. The reason we sweat it out in Burma and India is that this is one way of getting at Japan. It's a long way in a hard way. And to understand why we take it, you must understand a few facts about the country to which most of it lies, China. China has been fighting the Japs since 1937. Manchuria had already been occupied without Chinese resistance. Now Japan began to seize China's ports, walling her off from the outside world. The isolation of China was completed. Then, Japan set out to chop its victim in two. To stay in the fight, China had to have help from us, her allies. But her ports were gone, sealed off by Japan. And the only way we could supply the munitions and other help so sorely needed was to break down the wall, reopen the Burma Road, and deliver our merchandise via the back door. This done, we could help build up a portion of the Chinese army to a point where it would be effective in engaging the big Jap force, which now holds a large part of China, as well as assisting in the liberation of her ports. You must remember that China has been fighting practically without any air support at all. She lost all but a part of her artillery early in the war. She has virtually no anti-aircraft guns. No trucks to speak of. No ambulances. Very few doctors. No organized supply and scanty rations. The terrible shortage of goods of all kinds has inflated the currency and greatly aggravated her troubles. Japan, on the other hand, is well supplied in all the ways that China is not. And the Japs have taken every advantage they could of their military superiority. They've tried their best to knock off what they considered a setup. The surprising thing is that in spite of China's starved condition, the Japs have not been able to knock her out of the war. She's still in there, even though the Japs have been giving her a terrific beating. Whether China has fought effectively or not is beside the point. The point is that all these Jap soldiers, dozens of crack divisions, would have been thrown against General MacArthur and Admiral Nimitz in the Pacific, but for the fact that the Chinese army has stayed in the fight. With or without shoes, they've stayed. China's great manpower is one of the reasons they've been able to stick it out. 
Another reason is that they make good soldiers. They proved it in North Burma, where they had American training and equipment. It's to our own material interest, therefore, to help equip this vast reservoir of Chinese manpower so that they can still make a major contribution toward the defeat of Japan. That was our mission before CBI was divided into two theaters, and it is still our mission. As you can figure for yourselves, it is not based on sentiment, but on the simple policy of placing guns in the hands of men in order that they may kill our common enemy. Well, the Japanese realized that we would help China. And surprising almost no one, they preferred to fight Chinese who had no guns. Since Shanghai and the Marco Polo Bridge, they had discovered that it takes a lot of Jap troops to hold China down, even when the Chinese army was virtually without arms. Consequently, the Jap took the logical step of completely isolating China from outside aid. That was the Burma campaign of 1942. From their bases in Thailand and Malaya, they attacked at Mool Mine and Rangoon. They pushed up the Irrawaddy and Sitong Valleys. Outflanked the Chinese in the Shan states. And drove the British and remnants of the Chinese to India. That left all of Burma in Japanese hands. With what they could salvage of other Chinese troops, the Americans had gone to India too. India may not look good to you, but it looked awfully good to all these fellows who walked 150 miles over the Naga Hills to get there. The licking we took in Burma made our prospects of equipping the Chinese soldier and continuing the fight look pretty hopeless. But if we couldn't take the weapons to the men, perhaps we could take the men to the weapons. So during the summer of 1942, a handful of ATC planes operating without any of the modern direction finding gadgets now plentiful in the theater, flew 13,000 Chinese from Kunming to Dinjan and Chabua. These troops were flown in transport planes at altitudes well above their service ceilings. Through the worst kind of monsoon weather, without rest or replacement for pilots and crews, to and from inadequate fields, over some of the worst terrain in the world, and the entire 13,000 were landed in India without a single casualty. Many experts believe that will go down in history as one of the great air accomplishments of this war. More troops were brought in later. A training center was set up in India, and the Chinese 38th and 22nd Divisions were reconstituted. So far, so good, but it all remained a pretty minor effort. To augment it, we had to build up our Army Air Transport Command. We did. We doubled it and redoubled it. Then we established another ground force training school at the other end of the line in Kunming. We strengthened our 10th and 14th Air Forces. This additional strength enabled them to increase their protection of ATC operations. It also enabled them to harass the Japs in all the various ways that air forces can think of. But the strengthening of the 14th Air Force in China added substantially to the tonnage that had to be flown over the hump we began to approach the point beyond which the physical limitations of air transport made it unprofitable to go.
that's where the next phase of our operations comes in, the reopening of a land route to China. The only way to do it was to push the Japs out of North Burma. On Christmas Eve of 1943, we kicked off. The Chinese 38th and 22nd Divisions, later joined by a provisional American regiment, the Marauders, set out to tangle with the Jap 18th Division, a tough and veteran outfit, with Malaya, Singapore, and Burma to its credit. It was rugged country they had to cross, and lots of it. Contact was at the upper end of the Hukong Valley, where the Chinese operated in three groups, one against Sharaga and east of the Tarong, one against Yubang and Taipaga, and the third down the Tanai River against Taro. When contact was made with the enemy, the Chinese and American infantrymen had to fight for every foot of the way. the Japs attached to keeping us from pushing them out of North Burma, I can refer you to the fight they put up beginning on the first of that year. The mere fact they fought so stubbornly was another proof of the importance of our objective. Yes, the going was rough against Jap troops who really knew how to dig in and hide in the jungle. It took determined troops to dig them out, but the Chinese did dig them out one way or another, and one by one. While they were doing it, they had to be supplied by air. And it isn't exactly easy to supply by air in this sort of country. The position of every unit had to be determined, constantly charted, checked, and then rechecked. Supplies by the ton had to be assembled, sorted, and packed. When you consider the million and one articles needed by the troops in the field, you get a rough idea of the amount of work involved. Work and teamwork. It took a lot of different departments, each coordinated smoothly with the other, to make sure that the right shipment got to the right spot at the right time. The right spot. That meant the right spot. Not a couple of hundred yards beyond the clearing and off into the jungle where recovery was difficult, if not impossible. They had to hit the bullseye. They usually did. During that campaign, it literally rained supplies in Burma. It also rained rain. But no matter how foul the weather got, the supplies kept tumbling down. Thousands and thousands of tons fell out of the sky. Whenever and wherever 
food, clothing, medical supplies, munitions, or equipment were needed, look out below, here they come. Here come your dinners, your bullets, your mail, your medicine, your shoes, your guns, spare parts for your vehicles, your maps. Whatever you need to move on to the next objective, here it comes. Another job that wasn't easy was one that faced American medical officers and their staff of men and nurses. It wasn't easy, for instance, to operate under conditions like these. Now to take care of wounded deep in the jungle at the end of a long line of supply, short on personnel, short on equipment, short on medicine, long on nothing but patience. The wounded went out by plane. Nobody will ever have to sell those guys on the Air Corps. When ordinary transport planes couldn't get in to pick them up, these tiny liaison planes would be called on. If they had to, they'd land on your hat brick. Then they'd get out the way they got in. Somehow, evacuating the wounded is the phrase you see in the papers. It's like a lot of other phrases in this war. It doesn't begin to tell the story. Then with the Americans executing a series of left hooks, the Chinese went to Mangguan, Wallabum, Jambu Bum, Shadowzoop, Kamang, Mogong, and Michinaw. The Japs had been able to reinforce at Michinaw, and it took a lot of blasting to remove them. We had captured the North Air Strip, but the town of Michinaw held out, and the siege lasted 78 days. Finally, the Japs got discouraged at finding themselves dead, and we moved into the town. All of this irritated the Jap High Command considerably and they tried to cut our bengal assam line of communication by attacking the British at Imphal. The British were ready for them. Jap divisions and our rear line of communications remain secure. At the same time, the Chinese in western Yunnan were attacking west of the Salween. They were confronted by appalling conditions of terrain and weather. also were an obstacle, but not for long. Now the Chinese and Americans advanced on Bamo, while the British, backed up by other Chinese troops, secured their right flank by advancing from Mogong on Kata. Objective Bamo. The Chinese and American troops crossed the Irrawaddy and its tributaries and proceeded southward. Remembering how Michinaw had held out, they were prepared for a rough welcome. That's Bamo. Just as expected, the Japs were rat-holed in with the hole pulled in after them. 
Our next move was to make it a very uncomfortable hole in a very noisy neighborhood. Cleanup didn't take as long as Michinar, and the result was the same. We moved in. We had then reached a stage where we could foresee the opening of a land route to China, the Lido Road. The story of the Lido Road was a saga in itself. It was one of those things that a lot of the experts said was impossible. And a lot of you who worked on it must have thought that it was impossible at various times. Lido, terminus of the Assam Bengal Railroad in the Indian province of Assam. This is where the road, the impossible road, began. 500 miles to go to a junction with the Burma Road. 500 miles of a very considerable amount of jungle. Five hundred miles of hacking it down, clearing it away. Sawing. Chopping. And blasting. A lot of blasting a lot more clearing away. Yes, it looked impossible from time to time, but General Pick had said, the Lido Road is going to be built. Mud and rain and malaria be damned. So the road workers kept scratching away at the geologic nightmare that separates the peoples of India and Burma. scratched and scraped away until even if you hadn't been told, you could still almost recognize what they were trying to build. Sometimes when a section of the road had been built, the monsoon came along and washed out every trace of their work. So they went back and built it over again. This time, they built it up in the air, on a causeway. They built bridges. 25-ton ponton bridges. And log bridges. And portable steel bridges. Through truss bridges. They built every kind of bridge there is and then they invented a few. Then one day the road was finished. All the way from India to China, the roadbed had written a message of American courage and persistence across the face of the jungle. Many of the men who wrote that message were there no longer. Malaria had got them, or mite typhus, or heat prostration, or jungle sores. Huge ulcerous things that eat clean through the flesh to the bone. Sometimes the enemy got them. For this road followed always hard on the heels of the combat troops. This was the day of the payoff. It was quite a moment for all the men who had conceived, struggled with, and executed the project. The ceremony was simple. General Pick, commanding the first convoy, said he was ready to go. And General Sultan said, go ahead and good luck. And so the first convoy was launched. Right about then, they gave the road a new name, the Stillwell Road. It's a good name for it, a damn good name. But the name the experts gave it in the beginning is still the best, the Impossible Road. Truck drivers, we wish you Godspeed, but it's not possible that you're starting off to drive to China. That causeway isn't possible. Those bridges aren't possible. Neither are those turns. 
then is the Lido Road. But our mission does not end with the building of the road. In conjunction with it, we are building a pipeline, which will someday be the longest of its kind in the world. Like the road, the pipeline presented incredible difficulties. From Calcutta, where port battalions broke records unloading it, the pipe was transported by every means the army could command. It floated in river barges, traveled by flat car, rode on trucks, thumbed rides on jeeps, and finally flew in the very plains whose thirst for gas had made the pipeline a must in the first place. American engineers who built it didn't find conditions any better than they had been for the men who built the road. It was still Burma. They had weather and disease to cope with, those are graves in the background there. But in spite of the toughest, least developed country in the world, the pipe never failed to meet its target date of arrival at any given point. It was put down faster and farther than even the big inch pipe back home, which was rushed through from Texas to New Jersey when the Atlantic seaboard suffered a gasoline shortage. And there were no headhunters in Texas as there were on the Naga Hills. There was no monsoon in New Jersey stinking heat nor malarial jungle. No need to carry arms because the pipeline, like the road, sometimes caught up with the fighting. Through the completed artery will flow a steady transfusion into the sick body of China gasoline, lubricating oil, and diesel oil, one after the other, with only slight intervals in between. The artery straddles gorges, suspends itself over streams, snakes through swamps, jungle, jumps ravines, submerges under rivers, and climbs vertical cliffs. and thousands of gas-consuming machines that were just taking up parking space are now on the move. And without any added strain on the road or the ATC, which can therefore carry much greater tonnages of the supplies and equipment needed by China. When B-29s start off to smash a Jap industry, they'll get off the ground because of the pipeline. They get up because they're being lifted up by the men who built the pipeline the men who built it in spite of hell and high water. A very real hell and very wet high water. 
the pipeline is certainly the new lifeline to our beleaguered ally. There are several things that we must remember. The Chinese are in on this. The British are in on it. The British are not only fighting alongside us, they are furnishing us with a base of operation. Without our base in India, we could do nothing. Without the railroads, the barge lines, the roads, the airfield, and all the other facilities put at our disposal, we'd be sunk. Without those North Burma Chinese troops who have confounded their critics by brilliant performance in the field, we could never have started. This is not a one-party show. It's a performance by an allied team. So that's why we are in Burma and in India. We are here to force the supplies and equipment needed over the Himalayas to enable the 14th Air Force in China to make a positive contribution to the war in the Pacific. Your role here is just as important as if you were in Saipan or the Philippines. It is all tied into our combined effort to finish off Japan. Some of you men have indicated in your questionnaires that you think you are here for other reasons reasons you don't like. You may be sure you are here for one purpose only, not to fight China's war, not to fight Great Britain's war, but to fight our common war against our common enemy. We are all after Japan, and together we can get it done more quickly than we can separately. And the sooner we get it over, the sooner we'll all go home.